This question is about the different forms of carbon. Figure one represents the structure of diamond. And there is a key on the right hand side where we're told that the grey circles are representing the carbon atoms. And if we pick one of the carbon atoms towards the top, we can see that there is a three dimensional element to this structure where each carbon atom has other atoms bonded to it in a tetrahedral arrangement. We've been asked to describe the structure and bonding of diamond. Well, the structure is what type of substances make up diamond. And there are four options that you could have. You could have metallic, ionic, giant covalent and molecular covalent. And diamond is a giant covalent structure, sometimes referred to as macromolecular. And you could say either of these two things for the first marking point. And so this is the structure of diamond. And then when it comes to the bonding, there are three types of bonding that it could be. There is covalent, ionic and metallic. And everything made from only non-metals will be covalent. And so that means that diamond will be made of a giant structure held together by covalent bonds. And so the covalent bonds would be the second marking point. And then for extra detail, because there are different forms of carbon and diamond is just one of them, we need to enhance our answer by talking about how many covalent bonds there are per carbon atom. And you can see that all of the carbon atoms have got four lines coming out of them. And each of these lines are representing a covalent bond. And so that means that each of the carbon atoms have four covalent bonds coming out of them. Even the end ones, even though we're not shown all of the carbon atoms that this one is bonded to, we do still see four lines coming out of the carbon atom. And so if you see a line in a diagram like this, these are covalent bonds. Explain why diamond has a very high melting point. Well, the melting point for a substance is the temperature at which it changes state from a solid to a liquid. And as a solid, the particles are all very close together and there are strong forces between them, holding them in that rigid arrangement. And to change from a solid into a liquid, those forces need to be weakened. And we're being told that diamond has a very high melting point. And so this means that it will not melt until we reach a high temperature. And we need to explain why that is. And so what we need to say first and foremost is that in order to change diamond from a solid into a liquid, we need to break many covalent bonds. And that makes sense because these carbon atoms that we're being shown in the diagram are being held together by covalent bonds. And the only way that we could get those atoms to separate and move more freely is to break those covalent bonds. And so in giant covalent substances, we need to break many covalent bonds in order to change that substance's state. And furthermore, covalent bonds are very strong. And so that means that breaking them is not easy. And so to make that happen, we need to put in a lot of energy to break those strong covalent bonds. And we only have enough energy to make this change happen when the temperature is very high. And that's why diamond has a very high melting point, because it's only when we reach very high temperatures that the atoms have enough energy to break the covalent bonds, holding them together to their neighbouring carbon atoms. Figure two represents the molecule C70. And it's a capital C, which means the elements will be carbon. And the 70 is referring to the fact that there must be 70 carbon atoms making up the molecule. And we've got a diagram of the molecule here. The grey circles are obviously the carbon atoms connected by lines which are representing the covalent bonds. And we're being asked, what is the name of this type of molecule? And we've got four options. Option one is fullerene. 
And this is in fact the correct answer. C70 is a type of fullerene. It's not the one that you're likely to have been taught. That's likely to have been C60 fullerene or C60 Buckminster fullerene, it's sometimes called. But these two are both spherical hollow fullerene molecules. Graphene is a decoy. That's a giant covalent structure made up of a single layer of graphite. Nanotubes or carbon nanotubes, they're sometimes referred to as, they are hollow tube-like structures or cylindrical structures they're sometimes referred to as. And polymers are very, very large molecules. I'm showing a large molecule here. Polymers really are even larger than this. And they're sometimes represented by their repeat unit inside brackets with an N showing that this unit inside the brackets repeats many, many times. And so C70 is an example of a spherical fullerene molecule. Molecules such as C70 can be used in medicine to move drugs around the body. Suggest one reason why the C70 molecule is suitable for this use. And we've only got one mark here, so therefore it's really important that we do only list one reason. Because if we list two, and the second reason that we give is incorrect, that will invalidate the correct answer. So just one answer needed here. I will show you a few of the different options that you could give. First of all, if this medicine is going to move drugs around the body, it needs to be able to carry it somehow. And fullerenes can do this because they are hollow. And this enables them to act as a cage and trap the drug inside it. And so that means that the drug will be either released gradually or not released until it gets to the target area of the body. Additionally, this type of fullerene is unreactive, which means no side reactions will happen inside the body, which would be undesirable. And they're also non-toxic, which means it won't cause harm to the patient taking the medicine. And then one final option that you could give is that this molecule has got a very large surface area to volume ratio, which actually makes it suitable for all manner of different uses and as a medicine is just one of them. Calculate the number of C70 molecules that can be made from one mole of carbon atoms. And we're being told that the Avogadro constant is 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 per mole. And so that's being very vague because it depends what we're talking about. It might be that many atoms being present in one mole of atoms, or in this case, that will be the number of molecules present in a mole of that particular molecule. And this means that a mole is just a word for a number that means a particular amount of substance. And we've been told that we've got one mole of carbon atoms. And so carbon atoms have obviously just got the symbol C. And so if we have a one mole of carbon atoms, we've got Avogadro's number worth of carbon atoms. And since there are 70 carbon atoms per molecule of C70, and we have one mole of carbon atoms, we can work out how many moles of C70 we could build out of that one mole of carbon atoms. And to do this, we need to take one for the number of moles of carbon and divide it by 70 because each molecule of C70 needs to have 70 carbon atoms in it. And so we could make 0 0.0142857 moles of C70 out of our one mole of carbon atoms. You wouldn't need to include all six of those significant figures. I would recommend a minimum of two though. And so this will get us our first mark, the number of moles of C70 that we can make. And Avogadro's number tells us that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules of C70 per mole of C70. And so what this means then is that we need to take our moles of C70 and multiply it by Avogadro's constant. And structuring it like that will get us the second marking point of the three. And then the final marking point will be for the actual answer. So that number of molecules of C70, and that will be 
8.6 times 10 to the power of 21. There is likely to be a slight variation depending on how much you rounded it earlier on, but if you used those six significant figures like I did, you would get 8.6, and it will round to this number as well.